We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. It seems that the dream team put in place by President Joe Biden has become just that, a dream. Fleeting, difficult to remember, and gone almost the instant you wake up. Kamala Harris missing from the border, Mallorca's in a mess, and at the height of all these crises, American shelves are starting to empty. Where is Transport Secretary Pete Buttigieg? And why is he getting a hall pass to wonder where he may from the legacy media? Well, to help us with this conundrum, we're joined by economics guru Andrew Moran. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for having me. So tell me, Pete Buttigieg, he's in charge of transportation. We have container ships stuck in ports, supply chain issues are plenty, and he's not even involved in these supposed infrastructure deals facing Congress. So where's Pete? And more importantly, what should he be doing right now? Well, I want Pete Buttigieg or anybody else away from this file. They have a terrible track record of just ruining everything. So, you know, if, they, if you had another, you know, a member of, of the team in the White House intervening, it's just going to get worse. So I'm glad he's staying away from this file. To, to be fair, Andrew, uh, Pete Buttigieg has zero track record. And anything to do with transport, except I believe he likes trains. Bada boom. Nice. But, you know, uh, you know, he has made a couple of announcements in the last couple of days. Uh, it was just, just on uh, Wednesday morning he announced that the, uh, the administration is going to establish a 90-day sprint to keep the uh, West Coast ports open 24-7 to help ease the supply chain uh, bottlenecks. But he also noted that there isn't much the government can do about it because it is a private sector issue. Although at the same time, why is this an issue? It's because of the government in the first place that led to this whole supply chain crisis. But, you know, what I'm concerned about is if the press and the public keep demanding a federal response, then you know the White House is going to inevitably re- is never going to be intervene. And and I said before, they're just going to make matters worse, or they're going to try to impose these interventionist foreign policies that will lead to greater long term consequences. You know, particularly if you know if, if they if they impose their will, then it's going to lead to price hikes because anytime the government gets involved in something, it, there's always a greater cost borne onto the consumer. So I have more faith that the private sector is going to resolve this problem than I do of any administration official. Okay, in, in the United Kingdom, we have a shortage of heavy goods vehicle drivers at the moment, truck drivers, essentially. Uh, and this is what's causing the, uh, the, the empty spaces on the supermarket shelves. And it's being blamed on Brexit, uh, of all things. But it seems that over 54,000 British drivers are awaiting the bureaucrats to approve their paperwork to drive presently the heavy goods vehicles. Uh, and it, it kind of ties in with what you're saying there, that the government response is likely going to be bad, but it's already the government response that has caused the issues within the private sector. So is this similar to what's happening in the US? Is government red tape getting in the way of solving problems or was government red tape responsible for starting the problems in the first place? Well, I think it's a bit of both because government legislation, even going back, you know, decades ago, are still con- are, are are having problems today. So, for example, there's been some discussion among White House officials of of you know working with the hundred year old bill, uh, the Jones Act. I've written about this during the uh, Puerto Rican crisis. Now, I, I don't know if you were alive back then, but in the 1920s, uh, it was a protectionist measure that uh, regulated maritime commerce to support American workers. Now, the issue is that this restricts foreign flag. Uh, ships and U.S. vessels that don't meet the crewing requirements. Uh, so, so this prevents them from carrying cargo between the U.S. ports. So will this resolve the problem? Uh, it might alleviate it. It may not solve it entirely, but it's just one step that you could take that accomplishes two things. It gets the government out of the way and helps ease the pressures uh, on, on these ports, either on the West Coast or the East Coast. All right, let's expand our, our conversation a little here. Uh, the fourth estate, they're demanding answers, or, or at least they used to demand answers if a uh, a government boss was missing in action in any of the prior administrations, that there would have been hell to pay on the front page of the nation's papers. Now, you point out that having another government administration involved might not be a good thing, but why are the media so invested in Joe Biden that they're willing to just look past people being missing in action? Well, there's a there's a there's a great song from an old Fred Astaire movie uh, and Ginger Rogers. It's uh, he, they put all their eggs in one basket and they bet everything they got on on Joe Biden. Uh, if they continue to report on how bad of a job job Joe Biden is doing, it makes them look foolish because they were more outraged about tweets and conspiracy theories on social media. Uh, so everything. So if if they're showing by Biden negative light. It embarrasses them because they they put all their positive coverage on Joe Biden. Ultimately, it's just that their horse, you know, the horse in the race is falling behind, and they don't want to spotlight it anymore. Uh, that said, 
I would come to defense of Joe Biden because this problem would have happened regardless of last year's election results, whether it was Trump or Biden. You know, like inflation, everything we are seeing today would have inevitably going to inspire whoever was sitting in the Oval Office. So I have to give Biden some credit that it's not entirely his doing. It's just that it's happening under his watch. So, of course, you know, just adds to the terrible record so far of his job, of his tenure. For me, whenever I hear about supply chain issues, my first thought is, this is why we need to be completely independent. But the idea that the whole world has to rely on the rest of the world for basics like food and energy, this strikes me as lunacy. Now, I, I'm not sure you have the same vision here, Andrew, but what are your thoughts? Okay, so <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote about this very thing early last year when I, when I started warning about and started writing about the growing supply chain problem, especially in the aftermath of COVID in, in China. And I, would, I wrote about how the trade protectionists, they would exploit these mounting problems and revel in this, you know, in this once in a lifetime problem. So no, I'm not in favor of supply chain, um, and, uh, supply chain nationalism. Uh, you know, there, there are many risks in international supply chain as you would domestically. So uh, let's, let's go back in time a little bit earlier this year in Texas. Now, one of the notable shortages in the global marketplace right now are the chips, are, are the semiconductors. Now, everyone's losing their minds about how there is enough chips, you know, automobiles aren't going to produce, you know, uh, uh, computers aren't going to be sold, all that stuff. But here's the thing. The U.S. has been producing these chips. But what happened? These factories in Texas were shut down by the government early this year during the winter storm, uh, as per, I think it was Greg Abbott's orders. Some, Samsung has two factories in, in Texas. Uh, a Dutch chip company also has two factories uh, in, in, in Texas. So they were producing chips, but the government shut them down. So now people had to resort to foreign markets, which, which is a positive thing because of what happened uh, domestically. Uh, in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your backyard, in Europe, as we, t we noted uh, in a recent Allen Radio edition, an energy crisis is, inten is intensifying over there. The continent is going to have to rely on whom? Russia. Russia is now going to export oil, gas, and coal to this region to keep the lights on. Okay, so as world leaders push nations further towards globalism, whether the citizens want it or not, are we going to see more or less supply chain issues, and why? Uh, no, I, I think that the supply chain issues are going to eventually re get resolved in the future. You know, it's not going to, this isn't going to happen perpetually. The private sector is going to come up with solutions. Now, when it comes to globalism, I think you and I, you and I have still had discussion again, you know, I think it was a couple of years ago to distinguish between globalism and global trade. Uh, globalism is more like international big government and cronious trade agreements and politicians eroding your sovereignty, all that stuff. But international commerce is if, you know, let's say John Smith from Alabama, he wants to import t-shirts from John Z in Guangzhou. That's what global commerce is. It's not just, you know, you know, uh, George Soros sitting behind a, a desk and, you know, plotting his, uh, his tyranny on the, on the public. So not yet was, anyway. <laughs> it's great. It's great to have an international supply chain. Goods are cheaper for a lot of lo low and middle income uh, families. That's a positive. So, you know, supply chain, this, everything going on right now, the shipping container crisis, it's, it's going to be resolved, not for several more months, but it's going to happen. But of course, this uh, ideal future all relies on government staying out of the way. That's, that, that is an excellent point. But of course, we know the government never stays out of the way, but they wouldn't stay out of the way either if, if, you just, if everything was coming out of Texas or California or, or New York. Government still would intervene and oppose its will. Absolutely. Andrew Moran, thank you ever so much. Thank you for having me. Coming up on the show, we'll be talking liberty with Scott Casenza. But next up, we're asking, how did California become such a pit of progressivism? Don't touch that dial. You're listening to Liberty Nation Radio, heard across the Radio America network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC in Washington, D.C. And I just want to say thank you for listening and give a special shout out to those of you listening on KBKW 103.5 FM and 1450 AM, the talk of Grays Harbor, Washington. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Who are we? We are Americans that believe in liberty. We are a project of the nonprofit One Generation Away. We are patriots who apply the founding principles to the issues of today. And they keep moving the goalposts on us. We are educators and commentators who love America and the Constitution. Who are we? We are Liberty Nation.